Good morning, church. We're starting our first Sunday back at Sunday school. It's not exactly like we're used to, but uh, I'm thrilled that I was asked to be the teacher for this. And my prayer has been since Brother Tim asked me if I would do it, my prayer to God, and I have prayed a lot, to God has been that, um, that I can just use this to glorify Him and to help others learn about His Word. That's what we always come to Sunday school for, is to learn God's Word. And so this morning, uh, I know that some of you may have already been studying through your Sunday school literature since all this started. Uh, we haven't been able to have Sunday school, but we still had literature that came in. And most people, or the people in my Sunday school class, said they all picked up a book. And uh, we've been studying through our scripture, and we've been studying through the book of Proverbs this quarter. And uh, today we're going to be looking at some chat, uh, some verses in the 23rd chapter of Solomon. Uh, there's a section from 22.17 to 24.22 in Proverbs that's referred to as the 30 sayings of the wise. And we know that Solomon is known as the wisest person in the world, you know, basically in that biblical time uh, because God gave him wisdom because he asked for wisdom. When God said that he could ask for anything he wanted, he asked for wisdom and God gave it to him. But I don't think all of these were written by Solomon. He was the gatherer of them. He was the um, one who had them written down and recorded, but he might probably wrote many of them. But he also may have gathered some from other writers because we don't always just use what we know. We read other writers. We read commentaries. We read uh, things that um, that's, you know may help us to learn. So some of these may have been written by other uh, wisdom writers in Solomon's time. And the purpose of these 30 sayings of the wise basically was to help the Israelite young men grow to be godly men, men of deep faith, and men of integrity. And that was, you know, Solomon contended that if we have integrity and deep faith, that, you know, that springs from having the right relationship with God. We can't live those ways without having the right relationship with God. And so, so, he covers many, many, many uh, topics in these 30 sayings, but the ones that we're going to dwell on this morning mostly deal with um, over uh, indulging in alcohol, uh, alcoholic beverages, uh, strong wine in, in Solomon's day. We might call it, you know, any kind of hard liquor now. And uh, in our day and time, certainly it would relate to drugs and drugs and alcohol, or maybe drugs including alcohol, because alcohol basically is a drug that you get addicted to. So Solomon um, is writing down some of these things to tell young people that to stay away from those type of things. He also mentions gluttony. We're gonna talk about that too. A lot of times we, we tend to say, you know, it's terrible to drink too much alcohol and become an alcoholic but we kind of forget that it's also terrible to overeat and become obese. And, and Solomon covers that in, in the, the Proverbs. Uh, so God really basically doesn't want us to put anything in our bodies that is going to be harmful to the bodies that he's given us. And any kind of alcohol or drugs or um, too much food, those type of things, our bodies weren't made to be healthy with those things. And God made us a certain way. He did not make our bodies to be to have alcohol and drugs put in them to them. Now we know we have to eat. We have to eat some food to survive. But He also did not make our bodies to eat too much food or the wrong kinds of foods in order that our, it would harm our bodies. So that's some of the things, the topics that Solomon covers in uh, these verses we're going to look at this morning. And we're going to start here in the 23rd chapter of Proverbs and start with the 17th verse. And uh, Solomon says, Don't let your heart envy sinners. Instead, always fear the Lord. Envy sinners. Your heart, you know, in, in uh, biblical times, the heart 
was recognized as the place where human decisions were made. Um, decision making is so important because uh, we don't do anything without actually thinking about it first. Most things we don't. I guess some things we do spur of the moment, but our hearts are very important, or we might call it our minds, the decision making process. So he says that that he's in, encouraging these young men to not to, where their decisions are made, don't let your hearts dwell on and envy sinners. Uh, that sinful lifestyle that, that people get caught up in. And uh, don't uh, make your decisions based on what other people are doing that live that are living in the world and living in sin. That's what uh, Solomon is, is encouraging these young people to do. It, this is good advice for all of us, young, old, middle-aged. It doesn't matter. But um, certainly this was intended for young people. And young people do need to start out making good decisions. But he tells them not to envy sinners. Um, envy is, is, is uh, a word that it's a strong emotion where we, we want to possess something that belongs to someone else. And um, we know that in the Ten Commandments, it tells us not to covet, not to covet what other people have. And those two words are very closely related. But, but if you envy, you're envying the person that has this object or is living in a certain way. You're envying that person. But if you covet, then you're coveting the thing that that person has or that the way that that the lifestyle that person has uh, that, that they're living in. So the two words are very close, but one is related to the person, one is related to the lifestyle or the things that, that they indulge in. So Solomon is saying, don't make your decisions based on uh, what you see other people doing. Envying those people, wishing that you could be like those people. And, um, you know, we, we really should never envy another person of anything, really. You stop and think about it. We shouldn't ever envy another person of anything, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, because, um, you know, God gives us all different things and he gives them to us for a purpose. God gives us what he gives us because he knows that's good for us. He gives me something because he knows that he made me so that my life, that's good for me. He might give something else, someone else something different. He may give someone a lot of money so that they could use that money in a way that would be beneficial to his kingdom. Uh, he, he, might, he gives other people a lot of talent. You know, they go out and they, you know, they sing, they speak, they, and they write books, you know, and, and they do things that actually do further the kingdom of God. But he gives each person what he has chosen to give them. So we really shouldn't envy anyone anything. We should just be thankful for what God has, the way he made us, the way he, uh, the talents he gave us, or the way he made us, the bodies he's given us, the minds he's given us. Uh, certainly the fact that he has, has given us his spirit to live within us when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior but we certainly shouldn't envy sinners, a sinful lifestyle. And that's what uh, the world sometimes does. You know, you if you watch a commercial, you know, most of the time, the people that are, you know, let's just take a commercial that, that's advertising an alcoholic beverage. I mean, those people are all, you know, look like they're having a great time. They're all beautiful people, too. I mean, you never see anybody on there that doesn't look beautiful. And they just, you know, look like nothing could possibly ever go wrong in their lives. And that's what commercials are for. <laughs> They're supposed to sell products. so, But that's not what we should look at. We can't fall for that kind of thing. God, he makes us wiser than that. He tells us not, not to be that way. And that's what Solomon is telling. God has told, given these things to Solomon so that he could share them with people. And, and we should not ever envy a sinful lifestyle that another person has. Instead of that, Solomon says, always fear the Lord. Um, always, every day, you know, every day of our lives is a day that we trust the Lord. We, we trust God on a daily basis, and uh, we go from day to day. You know, certainly salvation is a one-time experience, but growth is every day. And you have to, every day, get up every day and make a choice. You know, make a decision. I'm going to follow the Lord today. Whatever he, wherever he leads me, whatever he wants me to do, that's what I'm going to do today. So, Always, every day of your life, fear the Lord. 
In other words, live in awe of this God who has made us the way he has and, and made us special. Yes, I'm special because I'm different from anybody else. You're special because you're different from anyone else. We're all special because God made us and he loves us and that makes us special. But I think this word where it says fear the Lord, I think we would understand it better if we said trust the Lord. Just trust. Trust God for whatever he's given us. Whatever the day brings, that's what, you know, God either let it happen or he brought it our way and there's going to be a purpose in it. So Solomon says don't envy a sin sinner, his sinful lifestyle. It's different from yours. It's not good, but you always trust God for the day that he's given you. But then the 18th verse carries that idea a little further and gives us the result of that. And he says, for then, if you do those things, if you always trust the Lord, if you always live in awe of this God who has made you the way you are, then you will have a future and your hope will not be dashed. Um, the future that he was writing basically mostly to young people here and we all probably pray for our young people that they'll have a wonderful future so he's praying for these young people and he's telling them uh you know your destiny your future uh should be totally controlled by god god has a plan for each one of us he lays a path for each one of us i believe he does it from the moment of conception and and he has a plan and that's what Solomon is saying. If you trust God, if you fear God and live in, in the ways that he has commandments and the rules and the guidelines he's given us in his word, you're going to, ha you're going to fulfill your destiny. You're going to have a future. You're going to have a good future. And you're going to be a person who, uh, uh, you know, some, even if bad things come into your life, it's okay because God will see you through those things. Your hope will not be dashed. The sinner's lifestyle, if, okay, let's just take a person who has a lot of money. If they lose, and they put all their trust in that money, and they lose it all, those hopes are dashed, aren't they? Not our hopes. We have God. It doesn't matter what happens in our lives. Our hopes won't be dashed. That's what Solomon's saying. Our hope, that word hope there is a confident faith that people have. It's confident knowing that God is always in control. He always is going to do in our lives what is best for us. And so that's what Solomon's trying to get his point across that, you know, you need a future that's crowned with hope and, and fulfillment, not by disaster, not by the things that happen in sinners' lives that just tear their lives completely apart because something didn't go right with what they had made their God. So... Solomon is trying to uh, instill within these young people the knowledge that only God can satisfy our deepest longings. Nothing else can. And we know that some people do use other things to, to fulfill their longings. The world's full of people like that. And it's sad. Those, that's our job as Christians, to try to reach those people and let them know that God has a better way for them. But Solomon says here, our hope is a confident faith, and we that won't be dashed because no matter what is taken away from a Christian's life who has a good relationship with God, God is never going to be taken away. He's always going to be steadfast, faithful, and always doing everything in the best interest of that person that he lives within. So these young people, Solomon wanted them to have the full blessings of God. And the full blessings of God lie in an intimate relationship, just an intimate day-to-day -day relationship with God. Going to Him, offering Him our thanks, offering Him our praise, seeking His guidance, uh, serving Him if He leads us in a certain direction. So always look to God. We should never look to other people or other things for our fulfillment. Always, God is the only thing that can satisfy us. He's the only thing that can fulfill us and help us to know what true life is. That's my page turning. I've got my book right up in front of me. I'm going along with my, my verses here to read my, my verses. So in the 19th verse, Solomon petitions God, uh, God's people to avoid heavy drink and glutton, being gluttons. Listen, my son, and be wise. Keep your mind on the right course. Uh, listen. How many of you who have children have ever said that to your children? Listen, do what I say. <laughs> I mean, you know, they don't always do it, but it's kind of a way to get their attention, isn't it? 
point your finger and say, listen, Solomon possibly could have been talking to his son here. He could have been thinking back on a time when he talked to his son. He could have been writing these specifically with his son in mind. But um, here he says, listen, my son. But I think basically what it means there is pay close attention. And he's talking to people who mean a lot to him, uh, people he loved he loves, you know. It could be anyone that you have a close, sweet relationship with that you certainly don't want bad things to happen to. We want our our children, our youth to all grow up and and have good, secure futures in the Lord. So Solomon says, I want you to listen to some advice and be wise. Be wise uh, with godly wisdom. Um, he, he's only wanting the best for his, the young people around him. And here's the wisdom. Here's the advice. Keep your mind on the right course. Man, remember we said mind, kind of like the heart that he said over here in the, in the 17th verse. Keep your mind on the right course. Um, your mind, uh, you know, the decision-making process where we, where we actually start to think about doing things, Every action starts in the mind. You, you always think about something before you actually take part in it. So keep your mind on the right course, the right course that God has for you. That is to trust God and only God for the course that he leads you down. Sometimes, you know, you might not think, God, where are you taking me? You know, this doesn't seem like, are you sure? <laughs> I know, I've been there too. Are you sure, God? But... God has the right course, and, and Solomon knew that. If these people would follow the guidelines God gives us in his word, that is the right course. Certainly, that's a good starting point. I've always thought that if we just try our best to follow what God has given us generally in his word, try, to, try your best to live by that, then I think God will start to lead you off onto different paths where, that he has laid for specific paths for specific people. But if he doesn't see us very interested in his word, hey, you know, it's hard to lead you down a different path when you're not even trying to go by the guidelines that God has given us in his word. So this is what Solomon is saying. Keep your mind on the right course and, you know, stay in close communication uh, with your creator because God made us. He knows what we need and he knows who we are. And he wants us to keep in contact with him. So keep your mind on the right course, the course that God has laid for you. Always be seeking whatever it is that God wants you to do on that particular day. Don't associate with those who drink too much wine or those who gorge themselves on meat. Um, just, you know, try to... My parents used to say, don't run around with the wrong crowd. And now, that was a long time ago when I was running around. <laughs> so, But... That's what, you know, the parents of my day said that. Don't run around with the wrong crowd. Don't associate with people who you know are participating in sin. Peer pressure is something that we all face, no matter what age we are. But I think it's harder for young people because they're trying to find their way and they haven't lived long enough to have enough wisdom built up to know how deadly some of these things can be in their lives. So, um that's what Solomon is, you know, just, it's better not to associate with them. Uh, we we can't stay around something too long. You know, there's a perfect example of that in the first Psalm where the it talks about the man walking down the road and um, he's walking down a certain path and then he encounters a group of wicked people and he stops to listen. You know, he, he first he sees them, he knows they're wicked people. Then he stops to listen to their conversation. He listens a little bit longer. And he sees their attitudes. And he sees that it's contrary to the character of God. But he keeps listening. And after stopping and listening, eh, he has sits down. You know, I'm tired. I'm going to sit down here for a little while with them. He sits down with them. And um, he starts to, starts to listen a little closer. Their attitudes start to rub off on him. And uh, in the end, he becomes just as wicked as the wicked people were that he's encountered on the path. He was on the right path, basically, probably, but he got veered away from it. Um, we can, um, you know, stay with evil long enough or sin. We can rub shoulders with sin so closely sometimes that 
it tends to help us make us drift away from God. And Solomon is, is discouraging that with these, these people. Don't drink too much wine. That's one of the things that he's concerned about with people. Everybody drank wine in biblical times, but certainly he, he's talking about it being an alcoholic beverage, fermented wine, and, and it's a depressant. Alcohol is a, is a depressant. It slows everything down. It, it slows down brain function. It slows down your body. It makes you numb. It helps you not to feel anxious. Those are, those are some of the things that alcohol does. But um, Solomon says, don't just try not, try not to get associated with those people. Don't get too close to them. And we don't want to leave this one out because we're more of us are guilty of this one than we are the first one. Those who gorge themselves on meat, those who eat too much food. We don't really like to, we kind of like to skip over that one, wouldn't we? But um, he goes on to say the drunkard and the glutton will become poor and, and, and grogginess will clothe them in rags. Now, we all probably, maybe none of us have ever drank too much, but most of us have eaten too much. And it doesn't make you feel very good when you do that. Uh, I'm an expert, so I know. But um, either, the, either of these things are not good for us because God didn't make our bodies that in the way that will take these things in and make and be good for us. What they will do is eventually just, uh, he says, make us poor in the 21st verse. If, you're, if you get drunk a lot, if you have too many alcoholic beverages, or if you just dwell on food and nothing else and you get... You know, your stomach gets so full, you, you feel lazy and, and uh, you don't want to move very much, then you'll become poor. Uh, partying at night leads to missing work or class or whatever it is the next day because our bodies just cannot function after we have filled them up with these uh, things that are, that are just not good for us. Um, now, Solomon isn't saying that we should never talk to these people. Because God clearly tells us it's our duty as Christian people to witness to those who are living in sin. <clears throat> so he wants us to have enough contact with them to tell them that God has a better way for them, that God doesn't want them to live this way and, and in this miserable way. Um, but we have to be careful that we don't spend so much time with them, like the man in first Psalm, that you know we um, that you that you find yourself. Um, participating in the same things that these people are doing. So he goes on to describe some of the, what happens to the alcoholic and the, the person who is a gluttonous, uh, who has, well, this is in the 29th verse. We've skipped a few there and gone down to the 29th verse. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has conflicts? Who has complaints? Who has wounds for no reason? Who has red eyes? Um, this is a description of an alcoholic or a person who abuses drugs. Um, well, you know, you start out there and you read those. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Well, you'd say, well, pretty much everybody has those from time to time. You know, we all have woes and sorrows in our lives. But how do we handle those woes and sorrows? That's really what Solomon wants us to dwell on here. How do we handle those woes and sorrows? He goes on then to say who has conflicts. He's asking some rhetorical questions here to get us to thinking about what he's just talked about, the alcoholics, people who um, drink too much wine. And, and then he, he has, who has complaints? Who has wounds for no reason? Who has red eyes? Um, complaints being constant complaints, you know, a conflict being fighting and, and arguing and, and always in a state of um, dissatisfaction, you know, or, or trouble or, or trouble erupting in their lives. Th this is the person uh, that Solomon is describing. He hasn't given us the answer yet, but when he gets to that last one, he has wounds for no reason. He, he gets maybe a bruise on his arm or a cut on his arm or maybe even a black eye, but he doesn't know where it came from. He can't remember. See, that's what alcohol does. It numbs the mind. Sometimes when we drink too much of it, we can't remember what happened to us while we were drunk, when we do uh, wake up or sober up. But the last one gives us a real good indication of who he's talking about because he says, who has red eyes? 
And all of us who have lived very long know that alcoholics, that's a sure telltale sign, isn't it? The red eyes and the, the red nose, you know. It's just a part of, of an alcoholic. They, they drink so much that uh, it, it causes their, their blood vessels to, to uh, show up more and they're, they're uh, closer to the skin. And that's what, so Solomon is, is leading us toward that question. Uh, who is this? Who is this that has all of these uh, different uh, symptoms, I guess you'd say, or, or is an indication of who this is? Uh, you know, they, they argue, they, they always are living in sorrow and always have lots of troubles and, and they complain about a lot of things. Uh, life's never just treating them real well. And they get wounded a lot and then they have red eyes. And he answers that question in the 30th verse. Those who linger over wine, those who go looking for mixed drink, um, linger over wine. You know, this is not a person who just has a glass of wine with supper. Uh, this is not a person who just occasionally um, has wine or strong drink, you know, and stops with, with one drink. Uh, personally, I think it's better not to have any drinks. But this is not the person that Solomon is talking about. This is the person who lingers over wine. He drinks one glass and then another and another and another and another. Um, in other words, he can't stop drinking. This is the person Solomon's talking about. And, of course, our bodies uh, build up uh, a resistance to, to anything that we put in it. You know, whether that's drugs, alcohol, or anything like that. After so long of a time, that can even happen with food. You know, our stomach can stretch out and we can eat more food. And that's not what we need. But here, he's talking about a person who, once they drink, let's say they started out with five glasses of wine. That would kind of give them a nice buzz. And then, uh, but after a while, that doesn't do it anymore. So they have to have more. Or they have to have something stronger. Or he calls it, look, go looking for mixed wine. Uh, maybe uh, the person in Solomon's day would add something to their wine to make it a little bit stronger, uh, maybe for sh flavor, but also for strength, to make it so that it could give them that effect they wanted where they weren't getting it from what they started out with in the first place. So, he, and he even says they fall in love with the way the wine looks. Don't gaze at the wine because it is red, because it gleams in the cup and goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a snake and stings like a viper. These people fall in love with wine. They fall in love with strong drink. You know, wine was so familiar in the day that Solomon lived that, you know, in biblical times, wine was just such a familiar thing to the people. Not so much now, but um, these many people who couldn't control their, uh, you know, live under self-control and control their appetites, They alcohol became a god to them. And they got to the point where they couldn't control how much they were drinking. And they fell in love with it. It looked good because it was nice and red. It gleamed in the cup. It was, it was pretty and it was sparkly. And they thought, boy, that would really taste good. That would go down smoothly. But Solomon has a warning here in the end it bites like a snake and stings like a viper. Got bad results from that pretty wine, didn't they? No matter how much, it, how pretty it looked, or how sparkly it was, or how good it tasted when it was, you were drinking it, or how smoothly it went down, it, then none of that really mattered in the end because what happened in the end was it bit you. Uh, it stung you. It put poison in your body is basically what, you know, snakes, and, and spatters, vipers, whatever. They put poison in your body, and that's what harms you when you get a snake bite, is the poison that goes into your body. So that's the same way with this wine. Don't just sit there and drink too much and gaze at it and admire it so much that um, it becomes a god to you. It's the only thing that matters. It can be that way with alcohol. It can be that way with food. It can be that way with so many things that we get addicted to. Pornography, um, gambling. Uh, there's a million of them, you know, in the world. Human beings 
have very addictive personalities, I think, some more than others. But um, actually, it's, you know, when, when the, what Solomon is talking about here, that this, when these people drink too much, that person becomes uh, addicted to the alcohol. They can't, they just can't leave it alone. It's all they think about. And when something is all that we think about, then there is no room for God in our lives anymore. So he goes on here in the 33rd verse, and he's, he gives us some more symptoms. Now, this is a person who has really become really addicted to alcohol, a person who has a lot of things going on in their lives that it just takes away the meaning of true life when you become this addicted to anything. In other words, when you put anything before God in this kind of a way, there's going to be a lot of destructive things going on in your life. And so, you know, any we know that it's true with um, alcoholics. They, they can drink so much wine. They may move on up to, uh, I don't know, beer maybe, and then on to hard liquor, whiskey, vodka, whatever. And But it's never really enough. It's, it never is, it never could be enough for them because they just, they want more and more. Drugs the same way. You know, people may start out small with something that they don't think is harmful, like marijuana. But eventually it can go on. It can go on to other stronger things, cocaine and then, you know, opiates and those type of things. They can't really get what they want from that small amount anymore. They're addicted. And then they'll see, in the 33rd verse, your eyes will see strange things, and you'll say absurd, absurd things. Um, they really don't, uh, they see things that aren't there. Uh, hallucination is what we call that. They um, slurred speech, that's, that's a part of being drunk. Um, it, it actually... Um, it impairs people. It gives whatever our senses are. We may be a very intelligent person if we're not drunk, but when you become drunk, you say absurd things. You say things you wouldn't say if you knew what you were talking, you know, if you knew what you were saying. So this is what Solomon is describing here in this person who has become addicted to alcohol. And as I said earlier, it just ruins your whole lifestyle. Uh, your bodies are... You know, this, your body's, you're not talking right, you're not seeing right, uh, you're not thinking right, you're not moving right. Because he says here in the 34th verse, you'll be like someone sleeping out at sea or lying down on the top of a ship's mast. Now, ships in Solomon's day were not uh, nearly as big as we think of ships today. Um, maybe 50 feet would be a probably a good size ship in Solomon's day. And they always just had one single mast in the middle to uh, sail the ship. So he was comparing this drunk person to someone who's trying to sleep, um, lay down on the top of that ship's mast in the middle of that boat and try to sleep. And if the water had any movement at all, you know what's going to happen. They're going to fall down. <laughs> They're going to stumble. They're going to stagger. They're going to fall down eventually, and they probably hurt themselves. And this is exactly the description that Solomon is giving us of a person who becomes inebriated, drunk. Um, they, they can't control their walking. Uh, they can't uh, stand up. They, they can't, sometimes they can't even control their bodily functions because alcohol really, it does that kind of a, a thing to the human body. It was never intended to be put in the human body, uh, not fermented alcohol to the point where it would have this effect on people. So you know, Solomon's point here is that um, inebriation results in a complete loss of control. Paul said this uh, over in Ephesians 5.18. Paul said that believers need to be under the Spirit's control, the Holy Spirit's control, not under the destructive control of strong drink. So this is just not Solomon in the Old Testament talking. Paul also condemned drinking too much strong drink. We need to be under the Holy Spirit's control. We need to be, our minds need to be sharp enough. Our emotions, our hearts need to be open enough that when God speaks to us, we hear him. When God touches us, we feel him. 
When God says something to us, we know that we have encountered God. So he goes on here, and this is not the way the, this person has had all that taken away from them because they've let alcohol take over their bodies or drugs or whatever. They struck me, but I feel no pain. They beat me, but I didn't know it. When I wake up, I'll look for another drink. See, this is the life of an alcoholic. Uh, it's a pretty good description. I've never known an alcoholic real well. I mean, a real bad alcoholic real well, but but I have encountered some in my life, and uh, it's um, it's pitiful. You know, it's it's sad to see a person who has let alcohol do this to what the body that God gave them. They don't remember if they've been beaten up. People take advantage of them when they're drunk. Might beat them up and steal from them. Uh, they struck me, but I didn't feel any pain. You know, I couldn't feel it. I was too numb from the alcohol. They beat me, but I didn't know it. I didn't even know I was being beaten. They have no memory of what happened to them when they were in this state. So, what would a person want to do when they want to correct this? Well, evidently not, because Solomon says, when I wake up, I'll be looking for another drink. That's the hold that alcohol can have on people. And this is what Solomon is warning people about, especially young people. Don't fall into that trap of doing what evil sinners do. Don't fall into the trap of alcohol or drugs or anything that God didn't intend to go into your body. Um, it's a major problem in the world we live in today. We know that. We know that drug abuse is just skyrocketing and and of course alcohol abuse too but i think we concentrate more on drugs today because uh, they're they're so destructive in the lives of those around us and you know this is something that satan has been using since solomon's time and before that you know, read way way back over into the old testament and you see that you know godly men got, men that god had used um, got drunk and did things that they wouldn't have ever done if, if they hadn't uh, been under the influence of alcohol. So Satan uses this, and he uses it for one purpose, and that's to make us have a God except the one we have, to put something else above God. This gets such a hold on our lives. It doesn't matter if it's food or alcohol or drugs or whatever it is, whatever your addiction is, you know, whatever your drug of choice is, um, uh, Satan uses whatever our weakness is against us because he wants us to put that thing in front of God. We have a God. We have a strong God, and we have a God who will keep this from happening. God, that God that we have, our Creator God, wants us to have a full, complete, strong, wonderful life in Him. He, he's everything that we need. He will supply everything that we need if we'll allow Him to. But we have to delight ourselves in the things of God, and then he will give us the desires of our heart. He will only give us the desires of our heart if we're delighting in the things that he knows are best for us, or that he knows that we need in our lives to have a good, full life. Why does he want us to have a good, full life? Because that's what he made us for. Made us to have fellowship with him. Made us to <coughs> serve him love him and give him supreme glory because he is our god we don't need anything else to fill in the spaces he's everything we need so god is um, he's the god of he should be the god of everyone's life but sadly many lives are ruled by alcohol and solomon knew that it was a problem in his day it's a problem in our day and we need to remember that to teach or young people especially, that this is a real danger in the world they live in. People will try to pull them into it, but they need to stay close enough to God. We all need to stay close enough to God so that He will have a stronger pull on our heart than anything in the world ever could. We won't be able to have that full real life that God intends for us until we give over and surrender everything to Him, and then He can fill us up. So, as I leave you today, I hope you've enjoyed the, going over through these scriptures with me. And I hope that um, we can do this again next week and in the coming weeks until we can all be back together again. I would much rather all be back together again. 
Maybe we'll get to do that soon. But I just hope and pray that this lesson has, has been meaningful to you and that uh, it's something that you can uh, take with you and maybe help someone else with it. Uh, someone that you know that have these kind of problems in their lives because we all encounter problems and God expects us to help each other. So I hope you, uh, I'll hope to see you, some of you, in a few minutes at church and others of you that'll be listening in on uh, Brother Tim's live service, then uh, I love you. I'm just so thankful that uh, we've been able to take this one more step toward uh, getting our church uh, back to normalcy again. So I hope that you have a, a wonderful week, and I love you all. God bless.